Yeah. Cloud and then we're live. We are live. Oh, LC live. Oh my gosh. Okay. This is so unprofessional. I'm going <laughs> to start the recording and then multitask <laughs> to put this collaborative doc in the chat before I go. Well, I'll say welcome to the OLC Online <laughs> International Summit while you do that. An online global convening on defining openness. That I. I'm so excited that this day is finally happening. Um, this is Clark Shaw Nelson, and I'm Angela Gunder, and we are two of the members of the OLC Live committee. We have a week of amazing programming, um, but what better way to kick this off than having a summit that is amplifying voices from all over the globe. Um, one of our Participants on the call, Eric already said he's really excited about hearing from people um, with international perspectives and uh, he couldn't say it any better. Uh, we truly are going to dig into all of that goodness today and um, we're going to start out with a little bit of housekeeping about this particular event. So we've designed this such that um, it's made to be collaborative and interactive. Um, so in a lot of sessions, you'll go and you'll hear um, profound speakers giving keynotes and you'll have to go off on your own after the keynote and cogitate and work sort of on your own. But we wanted to flip that around and say, what if um, amazing thought leaders from around the globe came to us and talked to us about openness within their context? And then we turn that around to you to make connections, extensions, and share new ideas. Um, and then what if we, at the end of that exercise, took all of that information and created it as a white paper um, together that we all would share. So um, that's the goal of today. You'll notice that the times are very brief for each piece. So I'm gonna be very brief with my intros and housekeeping so that we make sure that our illustrious speaker has enough time to engage us uh, in his talk um, about rooting open education within specific regional needs and specific goals that we have for the communities and the context that we work in. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Katsuzuke Shigeta, um, who's at, I hope I did not butcher his name, he's an associate professor and the associate director of the Center for Open Education, both at Hokkaido University. And um, he's going to uh, give us a brief uh, provocation. And then after that, we're gonna take about 10 minutes to engage in a series of questions. Um, we might change them up a little bit based on the way that the, um, the conversation goes as Katsu gives his provocation. After that, we will have um, uh, closure and um, Nate Angel, who is also on the line, a member of our OLC Live Committee, um, he is going to uh, lead us in a post activity on annotation um, based on how much time that we have at the end of that. So um, formidable challenge ahead of us, but we're so delighted to um, cover a lot of ground and a lot of territory with um, Professor Shigeta leading us. Um, so uh, I turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you. So um, good morning, everyone. Actually, uh, good, uh, good evening in Japan. So my name is Katsuke Shigeta, um, Associate Professor and Associate Director of the Center for Open Education at Hokkaido University. And uh, my part is the definition and uh, idea of open And uh, in my part, I'd like to explain you know, some examples what I'm doing uh, at, at my job. And the title of my presentation is How to Root Open Education in a Region with a Specific Needs, an Example of Japan. So I'd like to start that for five minutes. So could you, oh, thanks. At first, I'd like to try uh, some kind of classification of potential open education. As you may know, open education should realize equality and inclusion of education. It is very important part of open ed. Second one is to share superior learning resources. If we, if, if we could share the good learning resources on the global scale, we could improve our education and learning on the global scale. Third one, 
is to promote student success on campus. This is very important for you and for me too. And the fourth point is to share learning resources among institutions. It's very cut, it is a kind of cutting edge um, challenges. So if we could share resources among institutions, we can improve our education activity uh, with the collaboration. And the last one is uh, pedagogical change. It becomes very important role of, educa of, of open education. As you may know, one of the examples is open pedagogy. If we can utilize OER uh, in, a meaningful, in a meaningful way in education, it is very nice. So my question is, how is your region, organization, or institution? So please go to the next. Thanks. And I want to try the second classification of how open education spreads in a global scale on each region. First part is open textbook. It is very famous, especially in United States and Canada. It uh, contributes the equality in education, especially in uh, universities and colleges. Second one is, okay, second one is primary learning materials, and uh, third one is supplemental learning materials. And uh, OER is important as digital learning resources. And uh, we could use OER for the advanced learning resources and needs like SDGs or artificial intelligence education. Next, please. And I'd like to explain the Japan's case. In a nutshell, we have high recognition of OER, but we have low user, we use in a low usage of that. About the awareness of OER, uh, we have over 50% in the institutions, they very aware or aware of OER, but about the offering and adapting of OER and MOOC, it's quite low, around 10%. And uh, the finding of research is that uh, we find a difference of the purpose of usage of OER and MOOC. Institutions use OER uh, to improve, improve learning environment, uh, but about the MOOC, uh, Institutions use that to recruit students for professional development and lifelong learning. Next, please. And uh, considering the reason, I should explain the background. In Japan, on K-12 education, they offer textbooks free of charge, basically. And uh, in higher education institution, we, have, we keep a reasonable price of a commercial publisher's textbook, so we do not have a big demand of OER as an open textbook. So we are, are looking for the potential of OER as supplemental learning materials. So uh, in Japan, institutions develop and use OER for student success to create that by themselves. And we create OER for cutting edge education needs. Next, please. And this is an example of Center for Open Education, Hokkaido University. Uh, we develop uh, over 400 OERs for, 50, uh, for over 50 courses every year. It includes lecture capture, uh, skill training, and experimental videos. Next, please. And uh, we use OER on campus education and open to the public. We create OER for fleet classroom with faculty. And we promote active learning using OER in the fleet classroom settings. And we use, uh, we open uh, OER via open courseware on the MOOC. Next, please. 
And uh, what we are doing is to try to utilize OER for the specific needs. On this part, I'd like to introduce two our current project. First one is develop OER for digital literacy education. We have a strong demand for first year students about that. And we are doing a collaboration with Adobe Inc. to develop their professionals. Second one is to use developed book on campus uh, for flipped classroom. And in this case, we introduce learning context from a movie. And uh, students learn the effects of radiation, radioactivity uh, on the flipped classroom settings. So uh, what I'm doing in the Hokkaido University and, and my idea is that uh, adapting the specific demand on each region is crucial for the spread of open education. That's all, thanks. I should unmute this. Thank you so much, Katsu. This was incredible. Um, we had a question come in from Kelvin Bentley that I think is great um, that I'm going to share out. And I would also encourage other folks to, if you have questions for our speaker, um, you can please leave them in the chat. You can also use your microphones. I don't think that we've, we've um, uh, Black people from it. Um, but Kelvin's question is um, that he would love to learn more about the institution's OER sustainability plan. So how often um, is Hokkaido University updating um, the materials that are generated by faculty at the home institution? And how are you curating content both within the institution and then outside of the institution? And um, Kelvin, please, um, uh, Please feel free to chime in if I did if I did a bad job of paraphrasing or summarizing your question. Okay, I did I did well. So, <laughs> Katsu, tell us a little bit more about how within Hokkaido within Hokkaido University are you um, building new resources and how often are you um, actually updating updating the resources that are created. So, Kevin, thank you for a great question. Uh, this is a very important part of our, our center. Uh, we um, improve our OER year by year. Uh, so if we use OER on the classroom, faculty find the possibilities and challenges that they taught on OER. At the same time, students find difficulties how to learn OER. Uh, and the existing OER. So we find some possibilities how to improve that for the next semester. So we improve that for the next year student and we use that next year. So we establish a kind of cycle for the improvement. And I have a follow on question. How uh, would you say that the split is in terms of um, the number of open educational resources that you create in-house versus open educational resources that you use from other sources? Yeah, good. Thank you for your question. Uh, currently, uh, the portion of, uh, the portion is uh, about 90% of our OER is created by ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the 10% is uh, are used uh, from the other institutions. For example, we use uh, uh, OERs from Open Learning Initiative on the Carnegie Mellon University, and we introduce that and translate in Japanese and try to make some, exa some, some part of materials to fit to the context for Japanese students. So that, that gets to the power of Remix, really, at how we are, um, in fact, using materials from other contexts. But when we do, we do have to contextualize them for the, the, um, the needs that we have within our particular um, format. So just to Kelvin's point of how do we prevent um, creating OER graveyards where we have these huge repositories of things that are pretty much the same and not updated, I think that 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 redistribute piece, that sharing after we 
um, work on the, the materials that we've created, um, that's so key. We have to sort of pay it forward. When we take something that's open and we change it for our own context, we should explain how we changed it and then give it back to the community to further the effort so that we're not duplicative in our work. It's excellent. Right. Yes. Um, we have a question from Nate. So um, have you encountered different cultural relationships to openness? Is open different in Japan than in other regions? Thank you. Thank you for the great question too. Um, basically, uh, faculty in Japan uh, reluctant to open their materials uh, into the public. Um, there may be some reasons. Uh, first, I think first one is uh, they may not have enough confidence to open the, these materials for public. And, uh, and the second one is they are not prepared to open their, their resources public. Uh, in the beginning. So to tackle these problems, uh, we have uh, other projects. Uh, this is a uh, group effort of faculty to teach about nuclear education. So this is funded by the government and uh, this project uh, is, um, this, uh, this project uh, faculty, op uh, faculty open their uh, materials to the public in the beginning. Uh, they agreed that at the first time. So they have a preparation to open their OER to public so they can do that. So this kind of setting may be very important and the support of the professionals uh, to uh, deal with copyright issue or something like that is important too. So to facilitate and uh, facilitate this kind of uh, activity to promote openness is very important. Uh, only faculty cannot achieve that. We, they need support to do that. Absolutely. And I think that we think often about money. <laughs> you know, what is right. the cost of open? But what you're talking about and what Nate um, really provoked with this question is, um, what are the, what is the cultural uh, mindset? What is the cultural landscape that needs to be created enough to support open? Um, and quite often, I think we'll find challenges that we were not necessarily aware of. Like, just as you say, faculty that don't feel comfortable putting information out because they don't necessarily think that it's, it's good enough. It's a little bit of imposter phenomenon, I, th I think, in some ways that sort of prevents people from entering into the, the open conversation. So this was great. Um, Eric had a question um, about the OER needs. Um, are they delivered for the workforce, um, such as for nursing, for allied health, um, and for Japanese equivalents to those two? Ah, uh, yeah. Um, thank you for that great question too. Uh, this is not a project of uh, Hokkaido University, but I'm involved in the other project, uh, for the support, with the support of the government. So it is a project to promote, the, to develop human resources in, the, in the rural areas. So we have, they have local problems to promote the local business, something like that. In this case, uh, the government create MOOC uh, to learn the cutting edge business skills or something like that or what to try to promote uh, the uh, sightseeing people to come to Japan. So the government uh, develops a portal site of the MOOC and the uh, workforce can could learn uh, their, their basic skills about uh, this subject. Mm. Yeah, I've seen that commonality with, um, with a lot of places in Asia, particularly in China, where the government is um, supporting open, but they're supporting open specifically through MOOCs because it's a, it's a way that they see um, training a large percentage of the workforce um, and doing it at, at scales that in the US, I don't think that we even conceive or, or think about. So um, I'm very interested in, um, in perhaps us digging a little bit deeper into, into those, um, those comparisons of, of how we perceive MOOCs and how we perceive education at scale, particularly around open. 
Um, well, that brings up a good point too, that I'm curious about your perspective in Japan uh, and beyond. And I'll probably ask this of all our presen presenters today because I think it's interesting to see uh, in which areas, countries, regions, and so on, there are actual laws and or policies um, at the either state level or the federal level um, uh, surrounding openness. And for example, you know, um, in some places there are laws that say, well, if you get government funding or a grant to do a certain type of research, then you need to release that with a Creative Commons license or, you know, these types of things. So I'm curious to know if there's any of that at play in Japan as well. Yeah, in Japan case, we do not have this kind of open policy uh, for the education. Uh, we have big uh, demand for the open data or open science, but uh, our part of open education, we do not have enough policy to support that. So we like examples uh, of nuclear education, as I mentioned. So when we start this kind of project, we promote openness at the first stage. So uh, we um, ask faculty that, to open uh, your resources would be beneficial to spread your idea and spread your education. And uh, about the nuclear education, uh, we have a special backgrounds. As you may know, we had a big earthquake and we had a disaster in Fukushima. So uh, about the nuclear education, uh, the faculty had a big barriers, how to recruit the students to join their field. So, uh, promote openness uh, has a big impact for them. So they are very happy and they are very, in, um, they are very, uh, they are promoting to, op to uh, open MOOC and use OER for their education. It's a, it's a special uh, needs uh, in Japan. You know, another um, thing that comes to mind, I thought there was a really interesting um, sort of couple of metrics on one of your slides that I thought would be extremely interesting to see across all of the different regions we're going to talk to today. Um, and one of them was the sort of knowledge of openness, which I think was 50% or something like that. It was quite high versus the actual implementation of OER and so on. Um, and I just thought that was really interesting to see those sort of metrics and it'd be interesting to see those across these different regions. Um, and also the ways that you can try to, you know, make that smaller, that gap. Yeah, the, yeah that, that's that connects to the question that Jonathan put here um, in the chat as well. Um, he was wondering if um, there's an awareness of Creative Commons licenses and usage in Japan whether it's within education or in any other sort of arena or context. Yeah, so the uh, Creative Commons is quite famous in Japan. We have um, promoting openness in education uh, in the other field too. So the uh, open license itself is quite famous, but in the education field, it's so far excluding uh, some open course project or some MOOC. Excellent. Well, um, I will leave a little bit of time for us to um, continue this conversation. I know that some folks have started to type into the um, collaborative document. I'm going to put the, that for you here one more time. And if you haven't joined us on this document, please do. Um, so if you scroll down a little bit to session one Asia, under the agenda, there's an area that says collaborative activity. And we actually only have um, a couple more minutes in this session. So I'll, um, I'll let you take some time. Um, but the key thing that I would add for all of you that are um, here in this particular session is answering that last question of how do you personally define openness? So if you do nothing else in these questions, and you can pick which questions you want to answer, um, but none other than that last one, um, that would be a uh, of um, great aid to us uh, as we put together a white paper that has been inspired um, by the, um, the conversation that we've had with Katsu this morning. Um, and the last thing that I'll mention too, and uh, Clark, if you scroll down just a little bit more on that doc, 
where it says contributors, it's really important to us that you put your name and your um, contact information there because we would like to credit you as a co-author on this white paper that we produce um, based on the convenings that we have today as part of this summit. So we'll give you a little bit of time. Um, you can go ahead and type in the document and then um, in about, I don't know, maybe like five minutes or so, we'll see how, um, how well it goes um, with folks typing and adding to this. Um, we're going to switch over to, to Nate. Uh, I'll turn it over to, to him to uh, lead us in, in the next activity that we're going to do. So go ahead and type for a little bit. Oh, I'll actually do a little bit of a closure <laughs> as well to talk about the next sessions that are there. Um, I will also mention to you that this document, if you are a person that likes to take a step back to, back and reflect a little bit and then come back into it, it's going to stay open. Ha ha ha. In the spirit of <laughs> us having a summit on openness, we're going to keep the document open. So if you have colleagues that you're, they're like, oh my gosh, like I need them to contribute in on this. Um, that's, that's really important. Um, this will be open for them to, to share as well. Um, so while folks are typing, uh, Katsu, were there any particular resources that you left us on this collaborative document up at the top portion that you think um, people should really pay attention to, particularly based on the questions that you, um, you received today? Oh, um, open resources, the last two parts may be fine for the participants. Uh, these are uh, the explanation of Hokkaido. Number one is about the B. From OER usage on the flipped classroom and uh, use of MOOC, uh, existing MOOC uh, for the campus education. And uh, we introduce the uh, learning context from the movie. It is interesting. And uh, we, I, had, I have a link of the poster uh, I will present on the Open Education Global in the last, uh, 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 in this month. So if you look these uh, materials, you can find some possibilities or some questions, but uh, I would, I and my colleague are doing in Japan. This is great. I'm sure people are going to be feasting on riches when they <laughs> when they go through the resources that not only you've shared, but all, all of our speakers that we have today, they've been good about um, leaving quite a bit of, um, of goodness for folks to come in and, and learn more about the provocations that we've that we've started. Okay, I'm going to scroll down. It looks like um, we have all, some things going out. What practices can we cultivate to create a culture of openness is getting some good traction. That's excellent. What excites you about the ideas shared? These are great. I love that framing. The learning is already open. It's the access to content that is not open. Uh, I talk about that quite a bit when um, uh, I talk about the um, the purpose of faculty in the in the context of learning that the knowledge is an open commodity but faculty are those guides those wise elders those sherpas those connectors those concierges brokers i mean there's all sorts of different hats that that we get to wear in um leading people to that knowledge and sometimes um it, it's rethinking um uh, the the roles that we play in the classroom that are really critical to to supporting to supporting uh, learning in the in the best possible ways yeah without barriers yeah what does that look like this is great well we have time for you to keep on typing um there's time and space for us to continue to do this but my gosh that session went so quickly for our first one um a big thank you to uh katsu for our first oh sound effects board Oh, oh. <laughs> I can't, it, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. We it's have so much technology here. And of course, <laughs> we want the applause. <laughs> it's not there. We'll get it working for the next one. We owe you and I owe you for applause. Oh, there we go.
<laughs> Thank you so much, Katsu. Thank you to everybody who is participating uh, in this session. We hope to see you for um, our next one. Um, we are going to have a half an hour in between, um, and I'm going to turn the mic over to Nate Angel um, to guide us. But our second session, um, which starts at uh, 10 a.m. Eastern time, that um, will be wow. with uh, Don J. Jury from the University of Mauritius and um, Maha Bali from the American University in Cairo and um, also from Virtually Connecting. So a great, great session coming up. Um, we're just gonna continue to elevate throughout the day and collect knowledge um, for which I am so profoundly thankful and grateful to all of you for participating in this um, with special thanks to Katsu for, for leading this off. So um, thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, okay, and I'm gonna I'm gonna stop the recording. I'm gonna I'm like that grandma that's like I'm gonna stop the recording while I'm recording. <laughs> <laughs>